I'm a hazmat cleaner in a very specific niche. Basically, I clean hoarder houses, as well as family homes after traumatic deaths. It's a necessary job. Okay, first, imagine the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. Like being a parent whose teenager just shot herself, or the survivor of a murder-suicide. Then imagine going home after the reports are filed and the detectives are done, and having to scrub your loved one's dried brains off the walls. Yep, that's where I come in. It's surprisingly easy to acclimate to corpses and gore. Depending on the situation, bloodstains can be hard to deal with, only because they're always in context. The splatter on the children's Spongebob quilt. The smears across the cheerfully rustic kitchen. The violent spray over family portraits. The stark evidence of violence over the normal trappings of a family home can be disturbing. But even that gets easier over time. The hardest part is the smell. Sweet and almost gooey, with undertones of vomit and fetid swamp, sweat and unwashed skin. The stench strengthens and weakens seemingly on a whim. Sometimes I swear it moves. Drifting across a room, or directly overhead, or lunging forward to swallow me. But the rest really doesn't bug me anymore. Even mattresses dripping with decomposition juice get unremarkable after a while. Now, well, a couple of days ago, I was assigned to a suicide house. The victim was a middle-aged lady with hoarding issues. She lived alone. Her much older brother lived in a nursing home. She called him like clockwork once a week. Suddenly, she stopped calling. Four weeks passed and he was frantic. He has dementia and other issues. His sister was his only family. The only one other than the parish priest who ever came to visit. So he felt her absence keenly. By the time his caretakers finally called in a welfare check, his sister had been dead for at least three weeks. It was pretty ghastly, as advanced decomposition tends to be. The only one good thing I can say is at least it's been a cold spring out here. Low temperatures alleviate the stench somewhat. The house is a neat, narrow, little two-story with a slightly overgrown yard and a tiny grove of apple trees out back. Nothing out of the ordinary. Inside was another story. It's hard to describe bad hoarder situations. Entire rooms are overwhelmed with literal mountains of trash. Clothes and stuffed animals, books and papers, cheap gas station figurines, cat litter, dead animals, old electronics, the list is endless. And somehow it all looks the same. Just a morass of garbage and forgotten belongings steadily claiming the house from its human occupant. This lady was no different treacherous slopes made from old newspapers and books filled every corner. Christmas trees, stuffed animals, dishes, garbage, pillows, and so much more filled out the rest. Claustrophobic, filthy, and foul-smelling. As cleaners, we typically just throw everything away. The filth and biohazard issues make donation impossible. If we find something valuable, jewellery, antiques, and so on, we set it aside for the estate. For the most part, though, these belongings are worth less than the trash bags we put them in. Again, this lady was no different. It took two days to clear a path to the back of the house, and three days to actually empty out the rooms. It took a full day to clear the stairs, which, for some reason, were literally coated with dried vegetation and what looked like a metric ton of table salt. 
according to real estate information, which we always dredge up before entering a home. The second level had two bedrooms and an office. Yes, this is where things suddenly got weird. The bedrooms were immaculately clean, which was impossible. The entire stairwell had been packed floor to ceiling with garbage. There's no way this lady would have been able to clean up here. Even if she'd been climbing through a window every day, the entire situation defied hoarder behavior. Ignoring a sudden case of the creeps, I inspected each bedroom while thoroughly permeated with the stench of the lady's recently removed corpse. They were utterly spotless. The paint on the walls even glistened. Uh, the office was more like it. Stuff from floor to ceiling with dead plants, specimen cases and paintings. About a dozen taxidermy animals sat in a neat row facing the wall. It wasn't as filthy as the downstairs by any means, but it was much more in line with my expectations. Due to the smell, most of the stuff, cool as it was, couldn't be salvaged. There's just no reliable way to get three weeks of steadily worsening corpse stench out of household belongings. Even so, I took a good look at most of it. I'm an amateur zoologist. Thought I was going to be Steve Irwin when I grew up. Majored in biology and everything. So, this is where it all gets awfully strange. First, the specimen cases. These are the small glass displays, usually around 12 by 12, that people use to pin dead bugs and blossoms. You know, like butterflies and beetles. Now, these things were definitely bugs, but they weren't normal. For example, one was a coppery caterpillar with a flat, almost humanoid face. Pinkish skin, wrinkles, Eyelids sinking down into empty sockets and everything. Another was this arachnid thing with a blush, crab-like body, and a single desiccated eye peering up from the thorax. Yet another looked underdeveloped, almost fetal. It had wrinkled, sage-coloured flesh, and long ears that reminded me of a basset hound. At this point, I was pretty sure I'd stumbled on some eccentric lady's collection of gag gifts. The taxidermy animals made the joke theory a lot harder to believe. The first one I saw was this tiny, slow-eyed thing, with beautiful features corrupted by unnatural proportions. The second was basically a giant, lacquered anemone, with what must have been a thousand rot-rimmed holes boring through the tentacles. The worst looked like a person, with a frozen, open-mouthed smile that spread to its ears and five glassy eyes arching over the upper lip. By this point, I felt paranoid, even frightened. This wasn't right. None of this was right. A typical hoarder house on the first floor blocked off from a pristine, empty second floor. A typical hoarder house on the first floor blocked off from a pristine, empty second floor? And what were these things? Sophisticated fakes? Somebody's forgotten art installation? But how did these things get up here? And how were they all so clean? Because I was no longer sure if these items qualified as garbage, I carefully sorted and stacked everything. And then I got started on the walls. Paintings cluttered every inch, literally fitting together like puzzle pieces. Most were more or less unremarkable if cool-looking. Lots of surreal landscapes and stylized creatures, which are catnip to my fantasy-loving self. But one painting in particular trapped my attention and wouldn't let it go. About seven feet tall and maybe three feet wide, it dominated the room. Rendered in a hundred shades of green and black and grey, it depicted a misty, primeval forest drenched in moonlight. Luminescent flowers sprouted along upraised tangles of tree roots. A tall, forbidding figure peered through the trees, half cloaked in soft darkness. No features, but the suggestion of strength was clear in its broad shoulders and long, sinewy limbs. A curtain of hair reflected the moonlight. I couldn't discern the colour. The shadows were too deep. The lines and hues of the figure too indistinct to even begin to guess. 
After a few minutes, I realized all the hair on my arms was standing on end. With a huge, cathartic shudder, I spun around and pretended to survey the room. Or rather, pretended I wasn't afraid. As I stood there, trying to mentally reset, a draft swept the room. Wet, cool, almost inviting. And, after the endless odor of human rot, beautifully sweet. Trying to remember when I'd opened the window, I turned. For a long, mesmerizing minute, I couldn't understand what I was seeing. That enormous painting had come to life. Tendrils of strange leaves swayed in that chilly, fresh wind. The glowing flowers bobbed, flattening slightly against the roots as the wind buffeted them. Somewhere deep in that unearthly landscape, a high, atonal song sounded. Wordless and open-throated, I imagined it echoing off icy peaks and down below in low, swampy valleys. It made me think of forests and mountains, wild rivers and endless plains. The only thing I couldn't picture was the creature singing the song. The figure stood silently. Only its hair moved, rippling in the wind like a banner. Then it took a long, sure-footed step forward. Moonlight glanced off its face illuminating an impossible sharp cheekbone and a dark, cavernous eye. I bolted. I tripped down the stairs, falling flat on my face at the landing, then scrabbled up and ran out of the house. I don't think I even locked the door. Oh, I know I shouldn't go back. I don't know what that thing in the painting is. Honestly, I'm not even convinced it's real. But the thing is, I want to go back. Not because I'm fearless, far, far from it, but because I want to know more. I'm not the only one, am I? I mean, how do you look at this stuff and not ask what, why, or how? How do you not want to cross the threshold into that painting and see what's there? I don't know. Part of me definitely wants to call in sick for the next month. But part of me wants to go back. Maybe even tonight. Like I said, I don't think I even locked the door. I won't necessarily go upstairs or anything. I'd just be making sure the place is secure. Before I go, if I go at all, has anyone encountered something like this? Do any of those taxidermy creatures ring a bell? I know it's a shot in the dark, but if you have any ideas, I'd like to hear them. I went back to the house early this morning. The smell of human rot still clung to everything like invisible fungus. But, other than that, it was starting to look alright. The carpet still had to come up, but everything else on the first floor was done. I wasn't brave enough to go into the taxidermy room by myself. I did, however, check out the preternaturally clean bedrooms. The first one was as spotless, impersonal, and unremarkable as I remembered. More like a hotel room than a bedroom. The second had a dirty plate on the bedspread and a crusty old coat crumpled on the floor. Someone had broken into the house last night. All because I'd been too chicken shit to go back and lock the door. Heart pounding. I checked the closet and under the bed. Nothing. Then I prodded the coat. It looked to be big enough to cover a person. A massive pile of brown fur encrusted with dark dirt. Handfuls of tender green shoots sprouted along the shoulders and back. I plucked one, feeling a mixture of curiosity, confusion, and inexplicable paranoia. Then I looked at the plate. Crumbles of dirt and greenery mixed with what looked like sticks, all overlaid with an odd gossamer shimmer. I leaned in, then almost immediately reared back. Long, dark spider legs and, and tiny translucent bug wings. Shuddering, I swept through the house for intruders. I even peeked into the taxidermy room, but found no one. 
The isolation and general weirdness got overwhelming really fast. So I went outside and waited. My boss, let's call him Kurt, pulled up around seven. When he saw the taxidermy animals, his exact words were, Just fake freak show shit. The lady used to work for a circus. Guess you found her mementos. He looked the giant, hole-filled anemone up and down with a grimace. Eesh, real nice. Anyway, you're right. We need an appraiser. What about the other rooms up here? Uh, they have beds and dresses. I hesitated, but didn't mention the sprouted coat or spider legs. I'm not sure why. I know it was dishonest. Gotcha. He stepped toward the door, already set to leave. I'll make some calls. That way we can be sure we're not throwing away anything her brother's going to want. And after that, we... He cut off, frowning, just as a painfully cold breeze knifed through the room. <sighs> why is it so cold in here? I glanced at the painting involuntarily. Kurt tracked my gaze, and froze. Long, fern-like leaves swayed in the damp wind. Hazy moonlight filtered through thin ribbons of clouds, reflecting off a pristine scrim of snow that most certainly hadn't been there yesterday. Dead knots of flower vines clustered around icy tree roots, further testament to the senseless passage of time within. Kurt approached the painting with the same care and stance, one might use on a growling pit bull. I wanted to stop him, but didn't quite dare to. Not like I could do anything anyway. I'm built like Frodo Baggins, and he's basically Geralt of Rivia, except clean. He tapped the picture frame experimentally, and then reached inside. The ambient light from the snow reflected off the hazmat suit, turning it an almost angelic white. <laughs> It's so cold. Did you know about this? Yeah. He frowned, studying the feathery leaves on the trees. Now, for future reference, this is not the kind of shit you sit on for twelve hours. He pulled his arm back, briskly rubbing some heat back into it. Then he turned and beelined for the door. A terminal case of the creeps overtook me the second he crossed the threshold, so I hurried after him. To my mingled dismay and excitement, Kurt decided we were going to explore. He pulled ropes, pulleys, and harnesses out of the van and got to work. I did tell him about the figure I'd seen yesterday. Rather than fear or trepidation, a wild, almost feverish excitement lit his face. So, there are people in there? We harnessed up and anchored the ropes, as if preparing for a descent rather than a simple walk. Of course, he went in first. I watched, heart in my throat, as that silvery, wraith-like light washed over him. The tree branches cast spidery shadows that played over his form like living things. Ice crunched under every careful step. He grew confident quickly and kept moving, growing steadily smaller until he disappeared into the trees. By the time the rope pulled taut, he'd been inside the painting at least five minutes. I strained to hear. Except for the gentle rustling of the wind, everything was silent. Finally, the rope went slack. A breath I hadn't even realized I'd been holding whooshed out of me. Several minutes later, Kurt's form finally came back into view. Jarringly anachronistic and terribly, terribly small against the primeval backdrop. The towering forest spilled into a field of boulders, almost eclipsing him. The trees and enormous tangled roots in the foreground framed the landscape strangely. Bathed in that cold, hazy moonlight, it all looked like something out of a fever dream. Excitement coursed through me, overtaking my fear. I could barely wait for him to get back. I wanted to go in there more than I'd wanted anything in my life. He finally emerged, shivering, and immediately reached for a water bottle. Mud 
leaves, and a delicate webbing of moss coated his gloves. It's cold in there, he breathed. I can't believe how fucking cold. I can't believe it's fucking real. I clipped my harness in, and we switched places. The second I stepped across the frame, I gasped. The chill was so powerfully shocking, I felt like I'd been punched. I tried catching my breath. But the stunning, even alien, beauty of the scenery made it impossible. Everything was so much vaster inside. The boulders in the near distance were at least the size of houses. Trees easily ten times my height towered on all sides. Enormous nets of moss hung from the branches, drifting dreamily in the wind. The thought of entering that ancient forest made me shudder, so I veered to the right instead. The snowy landscape extended several hundred yards, terminating in what looked like a ridge. I walked briskly, trying to ignore a highly uncomfortable, unnerving sensation. It felt like my muscles weren't contracting correctly. It's hard to explain, but you know how whenever you breathe or take a step, everything contracts and then expands. It's like I was stuck in that expanded state like my body couldn't tighten up again, leaving everything unnaturally loose. Wind strengthened dangerously as I tromped toward the ridge. The snow seemed odd, possibly refrozen, crunchy, thin, and deceptively slippery. I moved carefully, steering clear of crystalline rocks and the occasional struggling sprig of greenery. I searched the sky for stars, but the dreamy haze created by the moon reflecting off gauzy clouds obliterated whatever constellations there might have been. Steadfastly ignoring the unsettling, boneless quality of my movements, I made it to the ridge. Straight down a sheer, rocky slope, glittering with ice and deep blue veins of crystal, sat a dark valley. Nestled in the centre were labyrinthine ruins dominated by a looming black pyramid. Arranged in weathered steps, it looked both inexpressibly ancient and eerily futuristic. The side facing me reflected the sky like a hallucinatory collection of enormous silver mirrors. The rest of it was indistinct shadow. It looked alive somehow, like sentient darkness masking itself in a facade of light. At the top of the pyramid, stood a tall, thin figure, face turned to the sky. Long hair whipped wildly in the wind, bright and filmy as the clouds overhead. A heavy gust of wind shrieked past, buffeting me dangerously close to the edge. I turned sharply and hunched down, hurrying back to the house. Temperatures dropped as the winds grew, and soon enough I was shaking. Ice and moon and bright snow mingled together, creating a glistening, dreamy atmosphere. Tree branches groaned as the wind tore their delicate nets of moss away. Somewhere in the distance, opposite the pyramid, that strange atonal song echoed. My bones and muscles felt looser than ever. The vibrations from that voice coursed painfully through my body, and for a few delirious moments, I was afraid the frequency would rupture my inside. Finally, the warm, mundane glow of the taxidermy room appeared among the trees. I caught a glimpse of Kurt's face peering around the edge, and I rushed inside. After the bitter chill of the painting, the room felt dangerously and oppressively hot. What do you see? Kurt asked. I described the pyramid as best I could, as well as the slender, long-haired giant gazing at the clouds. What about the thing making that sound? The song continued to echo in the distance, brimming with emotion I felt too insignificant to comprehend. Did you see it? No. Kurt started pacing, all the while staring nervously at the painting. Have you put all these things on the manifest? Uh, yeah. Redo it. Take it all off. Kurt? What? What's your solution? You really want to put all this shit up for auction? I don't know about you, but I don't want to end up shot by the fucking men in black. 
He paused and took a deep, shaky breath. Okay, tell you what. I'll take care of the manifest. That way, nothing's on you. All you have to do is keep your mouth shut. We're done with this house in a couple of days. Then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Panic and anger exploded. No, you don't get to take it. His eyebrows crawled all the way up into his hair. My insides instantly withered, but I held my ground. I found this painting. I could have stolen the damn thing and he wouldn't have been any the wiser. He didn't get to steal it from me. Kurt's expression smoothed, and to my surprise I saw a hint of relief. <laughs> Not like I want to do it alone, kiddo. <laughs> you scared me there for a minute. Thought you didn't want anything to do with it, and that's all. Well, I do. Good. He peeled his gloves off and absently scratched his palms. We'll leave it here till we clear out on Thursday. Give ourselves some time to figure out what to do with it. Sound good? Yeah, I answered. Because, well, there was nothing else to say. I spent the rest of the day pulling up the carpets downstairs. He wasn't scheduled to help me today, but... But he understandably wants the house clear as soon as possible. I'm not complaining. At this point, it looks like I'll be getting paid to explore an alien world. Kurt cut the day short after developing a pretty ugly allergic reaction to the filth under the carpet. Even with the hazmat suit, he ended up with huge hives spreading from his fingers all the way to his elbows. I wanted to stay and finish it, but he didn't want me alone with that painting. That's fair enough, I think. On the way out, I asked to spread fresh salt along the stairs and sheepishly told him why. He made fun of me for believing <laughs> superstitious bullshit, but let me do it anyway. Honestly, I'm glad Kurt knows, and I'm relieved he's taking the lead. Having someone else in charge makes this less frightening and more exhilarating. I'm scared, don't get me wrong, but for the first time in my life, I can't wait to see what happens tomorrow. Last night I had strange nightmares. Elegant men with decayed faces, and beautiful women in jewel-encrusted bull headdresses, towering horned shadows and spidery monstrosities with wet, rotten flesh swinging from their bones. By 4am, I was trapped in that dreamy, high-alert state of paranoia, peculiar to exhaustion. Sleep wasn't a possibility. And it's not like I was eager to welcome more nightmares anyway. So, I got ready for work. Suited up and drove to the suicide house just as the sun rose. I ripped up the last of the downstairs carpet and hauled it outside. Struggling to ignore a sense of feverish, almost overpowering excitement. Terrified as I was, I couldn't wait to re-enter the portal. The anticipation was almost painful. The only thing keeping me from hurtling in there, on my own, was cowardice. Kurt still hadn't arrived by the time I'd finished the carpet, so, mindful of the squatter issue from yesterday, I checked the upstairs bedrooms. One was normal, as expected. Heart lurching, I tentatively opened the second room and froze. Tangles of vines draped the walls and clotted the bed. A cool, earthy scent permeated the air, reminding me of wet woods after a winter rainstorm. The morning light filtered through the leaf-colored window, infusing the room with an eerie green radiance. In the corners and under the bed, clusters of half-open blossoms glowed faintly in the dim. I stepped inside, jumping when something crunched underfoot. A vine had snapped. I kneeled down to take a look. The dark stem burst with leaves, furled blossoms and long, wicked thorns. Silvery drops of resin seep from the broken stalk. Carefully avoiding the thorns, lest I tear my suit, I strode to the window. Greenery coated everything, masking all but the faintest hints of furniture. Unbidden, 
I thought of where the wild things are. That brought to mind the furry, sprout-covered coat I'd seen yesterday. I found it by the bed, covered in a mound of greenery. I gingerly tore vines away, grimacing as clumps of filth cake fur came up to. Pretty soon the coat was in tatters. The vines had wormed through and separated it to the point of ruin. And before long I found myself holding patches of fur and tanned, brittle hide. I pulled out the last few pieces, working it free of the stems and thorns, when something shifted. It rolled under the vines, rustling the leaves and flowers as it went. I reached for it. I was so short my fingertips barely grazed the hard, rounded surface. With a careful, calculated strain, I hooked it with my thumb and pulled it out for inspection. It was a skull, brown and uncomfortably soft, with a massive snout and no eye sockets. Disgust and panic subsumed me. Before I could think, I tossed it into the corner and stood. It took all my willpower to leave the room slowly. The only thing keeping me in check was the certainty that the thorns would shred my suit if I wasn't careful. Fighting off a shudder, I finally exited, decided to check the taxidermy room. I pushed the door open, half expecting a pile of thorny plants to tumble out. The window here faced away from the sun, leaving everything shrouded in shadow. Even in the darkness, something felt terribly wrong. I studied the room for several tense moments before it hit me. The taxidermy animals. Yesterday and the day before, they'd been neatly arranged against the north side of the room. Now they stood around the portal, facing the door. The five-eyed humanoid with the wide mouth took pride of place, positioned directly before the painting. The long-haired figure had returned to the frame. It rested on its haunches, poised like a sprinter about to take off. I slammed the door and ran downstairs, struggling not to hyperventilate. Salt crunched unpleasantly under my feet. The way the house trapped the thick, syrupy morning light reminded me of my nightmares, all shades of orange and gold and red. I ran outside. The door clattered loudly behind me. Across the street... A blonde neighbor lady stopped and stared. I avoided eye contact and pretended to busy myself with the equipment in the van. My hands shook as I struggled to calm myself. It was 7.30. Kurt would be here any minute. He'd sort shit out one way or another. Just a few more minutes and... Excuse me. A world around. The neighbor woman reared back nervously. Oh, I'm sorry to bother you. I just got back into town. Her gaze drifted curiously over my shoulder, then snapped back to me when she noticed me watching. I was wondering, uh, with that suit and whatnot, uh, is everything okay? I shrugged and gave the party line. Oh, I'm with a cleaning company, ma'am. I don't know anything about this situation. Oh. Her tone turned mildly aggressive. It's just that I spoke with my neighbor about a week ago. I just thought he would have mentioned the cleaning company. She looked my hazmat suit up and down with a tight, meaningful smile. Especially a serious one like yours. A week? Yeah. Kurt said the occupant had been dead for almost a month before anyone found her. But this lady had spoken to her a week ago. And what was this about a male neighbor? Ma'am, I'm sorry. I'm just an employee. I can show you my credentials, uh, give you my boss's number, but... She backed off immediately. No, no, it's fine. No worries, just a little concerned. We're tightening it here. I waited until she crossed the street, then called Kurt. He didn't answer. Maybe he was driving. And he only lived 15, maybe 20 minutes away. He'd arrive any second. Half an hour passed before I gave up and went to his house. When I got there, both his vehicles were in the driveway. He didn't answer the door, so I tried the knob. 
Locked, of course. Kurt? Fighting a surge of panic, I felt around for a spare key. I found one tucked into a crack in the doorframe. It took a minute to pry out, but it fit the lock just fine. Kurt, it's just me. I... He sat, naked and cross-legged in the living room floor, right in the middle of the light streaming through the window. He looked up at me. Sunlight threw his features into sharp relief and turned the beads of sweat on his face to diamonds. Stay there, he whispered, and shut up. I looked him over, horror building in my chest. My gorge rose. Holes. A hideous, trypophobic nightmare spreading from his biceps to fingertips. Hundreds of them, small and dark and round, like termite burrows, all rimmed in red, welted flesh. They don't like the sun, he whispered. I think it kills them. My stomach heaved. Kill what? Have a look. Bruisey bags puffed out under his eyes, making him look twenty years older and terribly sick. Keep your suit on. I knelt beside him and forced myself to look. Sunlight bounced off the bottom of the holes, revealing soft, glistening white flesh. At first, I thought they were deep boils. Then I noticed they were quivering. Finally, I saw the eyes, tiny and fish-like, flitting wildly to and fro. I emitted a low whine that made me want to shoot myself. Don't, his voice broke. Look, some are already dead. He rolled one of his wrists, and sure enough, a few of the holes had bubbled over with jelly. Two of those goldfish eyes were suspended in the murk, glinting like tiny coins. I tried to call 911, but Kurt threatened to attack and infect me. The thing is, he's four times my size. He'd have no trouble hurting me in the short interval between the phone call and the ambulance's arrival. I'm pretty tough, but the thought of those holes, of those quivering jelly worms burrowing into my skin. Oh, no. I'd let him die before letting him pass those onto me. He asked me to sit with him, and I obliged. Every once in a while I'd hear a small pop. Then he'd gasp as a geezer of translucent ichor bubbled out of the holes. After a while that viscous gel covered his arms, shining with an iridescence that made my stomach churn. Eyes swam in the gunk, slowly dripping onto the carpet. You caught them inside the painting? I finally asked. He released a shaky breath. In those woods, there was uh, something like a weird giant skeleton. I tripped and went down under the ribs into a patch of thistles, it looked like. Poked a few holes in my gloves. It punctured your gloves, and you came back through? What? Was I fucking supposed to stay in there? I heard another low, wet pop. Kurt hissed as a tiny volcano of pale gel oozed over his left wrist, obscuring several holes. They made me sick and panicky, but I could barely look away. Well, there are plants in one of the bedrooms now. I explained everything as quickly as I could, from the flower vines and soft eyeless skull to the ominous rearrangement of the taxidermy animals. He tried to interrupt, but I kept going. What do you know about the lady who lived there? Nothing, he answered calmly, but for just an instant, his face flickered. Really? Because a lady from across the street came over and told me her neighbor is very much alive. I stood up. He followed suit, grimacing only slightly. Where are you going? To the office. My throat was painfully dry. I'm going to find her brother's information. Without thinking, I bolted for the door. He caught me easily, hand tight as a vice around my elbow. 
Jelly and glittering eyes smeared my suit. You're not going to tell anyone anything. Then tell me what's going on. <sighs> okay. He dragged me back to the living room and threw me on the sofa. That house is mine. A thousand horrifying conclusions ran through my head. But the lady who lived there was my wife. So, this is more or less what he said. Kurt's wife, Evie, has been missing a lot longer than four weeks. Their relationship was fraught, and they'd separated, though not divorced, six years ago. He checked in periodically, always hoping for the possibility of reconciliation, but that never happened. The last time he spoke to her was over a year ago, and she'd sounded terrified. Kurt didn't think much of it, as Evie was prone to hysteria, and not mentally or emotionally well. After that, she'd stopped taking his calls. About four months ago, she knocked on his front door, but it couldn't have been her. Evie was 56 years old. The girl on the porch would have been a dead ringer, except she was thirty years too young. She was giggly and excited, and uttered endless strings of gibberish. When he freaked out, she shoved him into a wall with enough force to knock him out. When he came to, she was gone. And, as he shortly found out, so was Evie's house. Now, a house was always on the property, but it was never the right house. Every day Kurt saw a different structure and different occupants. He saw everything from tacky Tudor-style condos to low-slung sprawlers to wood cottages and, once, a turreted blue monstrosity. But finally, just a couple of weeks ago, the house reverted to the neat little two-story he'd bought for her after their separation. He broke in and immediately reared back gagging from the overpowering stench. He found her sprawl on the living room, liquefying corpse slowly bonding into the carpet. When he checked the house afterward, even going so far as to use a ladder to peer into the upstairs windows, he found nothing strange, certainly no taxidermy monstrosities or transdimensional portals. The house hasn't changed since, but the weird specimens and awful painting appeared recently, He's afraid this means the house is about to disappear again. Oh, fine. Just fucking dandy. Why the goddamn hell did you involve me? I snarled. I couldn't go in there after seeing her like that. He answered quietly. I sense deception here. Maybe an omission. Maybe an outright lie. I couldn't tell. I didn't have the presence of mind to pin him down on it. Instead... I angrily blurted, Why did you tell me she worked for the circus? <laughs> she did. The house is the circus. So, I don't know if you know this, but a circus has a definition other than the clowns and elephants variety. A circus is a sort of open public space where several avenues converge. Circuses have been the crux of his last phone conversation with Evie. She sobbed that she was tired of the circus, that the circus wanted too much, that she no longer knew what to do with the circus. <sighs> so, what's the goal here? I made my voice deliberately callous. You own the house. Why don't you just burn it all down? Because... He cut off, hissing. A series of unwholesome pops filled the room. Fluid erupted from a dozen holes in his arm. He grimaced. Because that girl, whenever she was, wasn't my wife. She was too young. I think Evie might be alive. In the painting? Through the portal, he corrected. He spread his arms, a rain of jelly patted to the floor. Oh, I didn't want to involve you, but I can't do this alone. Sure you can, I thought bitterly. But I didn't say it, because, well, you know what? I can't get the idea of the circus out of my head. An untold number of avenues from different dimensions and realities, converging on a single, 
unremarkable spot in the West Coast Gross's mid-sized city. Well, and that bitterly cold, beautiful world of luminescent moonflowers and trees draped in breathtakingly intricate nets of moss, and the labyrinth, of course, that dark labyrinth with a black pyramid at its centre. I'll never have a chance like this again. Never in my life. <laughs> okay, I said. What do you want me to do? <sighs> Lay in the yard for a while. In the sun. Just in case these things are on your suit. Then, go home. I'll call you when the infestation's dead. I did as he said. Lingering in his yard till sunset. I checked on him one more time, still stretched out on his living room carpet, squeezing fluid from those sickening holes, and then went home. I've been waiting for him to call ever since. I hope his infestation's done. I know I have a lot of other things to worry about, but I can't stop thinking about those holes in Kurt's skin. It's great that sunlight kills them, but I'm scared of what will happen in the dark. By midnight, I still hadn't heard from Kurt, which was surprising. He'd been doing extremely well for a man whose arms looked like fleshy honeycombs, and I expected him to check in periodically, if only to let me know he was still alive. It occurred to me that I was expecting too much. Under the circumstances, it's easy to forget that I'm his employee, not his friend or anything else. My impatience probably seems ridiculous, but the drive to learn, know, understand and seek is all-consuming. The prospect of exploring a new world is overwhelming. I want an adventure so much. It's what I've wanted my entire life. And then, well, there's Kurt. He's a good guy, and I care about him probably more than I should. I want to help him, and, feelings aside, I have no way to explore this new world if Kurt dies. So, around 11.30 on Tuesday night, I decided to go check on him. I opened my door, only to find myself face to face with a stranger. It was a woman, copper-eyed and terribly pale, with a choppy, tangled mess of black hair. Chris, she whispered. Yes, I said automatically. Kurt's at the circus, she said. He needs your help. I trusted her for a second before, well, every alarm in my body went off. I tried to slam the door, but she struck forward and wrapped cold fingers around my wrist. The second she touched me, her pallor warmed into a heartbreaking peaches and cream complexion. Dull eyes brightened, and dirty hair turned smooth and thick. My own fear and panic evaporated, replaced with a single-minded objective. Help Kurt. I drove to the house with the stranger. The car didn't agree with her. Within moments she was whimpering and vomiting. But I was so focused on my goal that she barely even registered. When we got there, she grabbed my hand and walked me to the second floor. You're the only one allowed inside. Strings of vomit glistened on her chin. She pointed to the vine-choked bedroom. In there. She retreated as I threw open the door. Even in my mesmerized state, the room shocked me. It was nothing but a lush grove of vines, striated leaves, and soft, luminescent flowers. I entered. Cut! Vines crunched under my feet. I winced only slightly as a thorn tore through the sole of my shoe and punched a hole in my heel. Blood gushed, soaking the sock and dripping through the hole. I shook it irritably, vaguely satisfied as drops pattered against leaves and petals. Flowers flared brightly where the blood hit. The light swiftly spread from flower to flower, a multicolored chain reaction of bright blossoms. 
A shadow shifted in the corner. Relief flooded me, and I ran over. Kurt, are you okay? The figure reared up. Glowing flowers illuminated an eyeless head that might have been bovine were it not for the teeth. I thought of the coat. That strange fur coat full of dirt and sprouts. Oh, not a coat. A skin. But it had been dead. I'd seen and touched its skull. I'd pulled its hide to pieces. How was it still alive? The creature lurched forward. Woody vine snapped under massive paws. Long, lupine teeth reflected the eerie light of the flowers. I turned and ran, slamming the door just as the creature pounced. It hit the door with a bone-shaking crack. I darted towards the stairs, stopping when I saw the girl. No longer whole and healthy, not even human. Leathery skin cascaded from her limbs, lumping and folding over itself. Her head was wide and flat, with three enormous eyes and a superating snub nose. I span around and ran to the other bedroom. It was locked. To my shock, voices and music issued from behind it. I pounded on the door, screaming, but no one responded. If anything, the music, soft, playful piping, actually got louder. The eyeless monster tore a hole in the other door and started to squeeze through. Once again I lunged for the stairwell, but the girl warped, growing into a multi-limbed monstrosity. I screamed and dashed to the taxidermy room, locking the door behind me. The muffled sounds of music and laughter permeated the room, punctuated by the frantic snarling of the eyeless monster. The taxidermy animals had changed position yet again, flanking the painting like an honor guard. Somehow, the painting's perspective had changed. Instead of that stunning sylvan landscape of trees and flower-growing vines, it displayed a breathtaking vista of the labyrinth valley. The pyramid loomed to the left, cubed steps flashing silver in the moonlight. A warm breeze drifted from the painting, carrying strains of that alien song and the wet, green scent peculiar to lush summers. <gasps> Summertime. But yesterday... That land had been in the throes of winter. What was going on? The monster crashed into the door, breaking my reverie while sending an explosion of splinters across the room. Without thinking, I ran into the portal. Humid, sweet-smelling air enveloped me. Soft tangles of grass and wildflowers carpeted the ground. Finally, I noticed the pain radiating from my punctured foot. My entire shoe squelched with every step, making my stomach churn. The pyramid towered nearby, ringed on all sides by a maze of massive walls. Awestruck, I started to slow down just as I heard a heavy, thudding gallop. I looked over my shoulder and saw the eyeless creature tearing through the grass ran low to the ground, long snout stretched outward. I sprinted toward the labyrinth and veered wildly to the right. An unbroken expanse of wall curved as far as I could see. Even through my fear, I marveled at it. The walls were smooth and richly dark. Carvings covered every surface, a mixture of unrecognizable characters and hieroglyphs. Finally, I saw a light ahead, soft and soothing green. It reflected off the walls like a beacon. Grimly ignoring the galloping monstrosity behind me, I put on a final burst of speed and ran to the entrance. The eyeless thing caught me just as I crossed the threshold, batting me down. I squirmed away, heedless of the sharp undergrowth prickling my skin. It caught me easily and swiped. Burning pain subsumed my wrist, followed by a cascade of slick, 
wet heat. Light erupted all around me, the flowers again, blazing to life. I cradled my injured wrist, shivering as blood streamed over my fingers. The monster thrust its snout against my throat. For a terrible instant, its teeth pressed into the soft skin. Then it pulled back leaving a cluster of fur and sprouts in the hollow of my throat. I crawled to my knees, sobbing, and scuttled away. The pale light illuminated it fully. A broad, bony crest lay atop its long snout, creating a sharp angle that somehow looked inorganic. Thin, brittle skin stretched painfully over its skull, splitting apart in several places to reveal the bone beneath didn't have enough flesh to cover its teeth or gums, resulting in a perpetual snarl. Its head was enormous, far too large for its low, muscular body. It tried to raise its head, but couldn't. The snout lifted several inches before plummeting back into the earth. The monstrosity retreated suddenly, disappearing into the tall grass as a shadow swept across me. I turned around already knowing what I would see. Sleek, long hair shone like glass. Inhumanly sharp planes created an angular, hypnotic face that was equal parts breathtaking and horrifying. He knelt in front of me. I kicked away, feet tangling in the long grass, but grabbed my hands and pulled me close. His skin glimmered strangely, Moon-white and iridescent, comprised of a delicate overlapping pattern that reminded me of scales. He inspected my wound, iron grip pressing down to the bone. Then he passed my wrist to his forehead, smearing my blood all over his face. Somewhere in the labyrinth, a throaty, atonal song began to echo. Finally, he brought the gash to his mouth and sucked. Agony immediately exploded. I thought of poison, of venom, acid eating me down to the bone. This was it. This was fucking it. I was dying outside an alien pyramid in a shitty painting while a half-starved reptilian dissolved me with his tongue. I whited out. Sometime later I woke propped against the labyrinth. I shot up and scanned my surroundings. Nothing. No lights. No monsters. Just brambly flower fields and the endless curve of the wall. I retraced my path and soon found the portal to the taxidermy room. I entered anxiously. Everything was still and silent, with no music or laughter to be heard. I hurried into the hallway. No eyeless monsters or warped, multi-limbed girls waiting on the stairs. <laughs> I sobbed with relief and ran downstairs, but stopped when I saw the front door. The five-eyed taxidermy monstrosity sat just to the side. Glass irises glittered over its unsettling wraparound smile. It looked for all the world like I'd caught it in the act of blocking the door. Those relieved sobs morphed into frightened crying. But what was I supposed to do? Go to the backyard, taking my eyes off this thing in the process? No. Fighting a surge of panic, I tiptoed to the door, staying as far away from the creature as I could. It towered over me. The top of its head grazed the doorframe. Had it been that big before? I couldn't remember. With a choked grasp, I opened the door and ran out into the night. I expected it to follow, but I reached my car safely. I thought immediately of Kurt. The warp girl had used him to lure me away. Maybe this meant he was dead. Maybe it meant something even worse. I had to know either way. So I drove to his house, struggling to suppress visions of limbs so full of holes that they split apart. 
When I pulled up, I saw all his lights were on. I got out of the car, almost laughing with relief. This relief soured when Kurt opened the door. I stopped in my tracks. He looked unwell. His hair lay slicked against his scalp, and his skin glistened under the porch light. My stomach clenched, but I approached anyway. Kurt, sorry for stopping by this late. I just... He shushed me and beckoned. His movements were slow, almost clumsy. Where have you been? He whispered. I've been trying to call you all fucking day. My skin prickled. Why? Are you okay? I'll just come inside, he hissed. Now. An imaginary itch, dirty and pervasive, dreamed its way across my skin. But it wasn't enough to stop me. None of it was. Not the portal or the pyramid. Not the eyeless monster or the long-haired man. Certainly not Kurt or the deep, burrowing holes in his arms. So, I went to him. Up close, Kurt's skin looked painfully weird. Far too smooth and almost slimy, like he'd coated himself in a thin layer of Vaseline. And his arms, well, the holes were gone. Whole, unblemished flesh. Not only healed, but completely regenerated. I slowed to a halt, unwilling to march up those steps. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Instead of the usual brown, his eyes looked coppery and somehow multifaceted. They weren't Kurt's eyes. With horror, I realized they weren't even human eyes. A hundred tiny, shimmering discs composed each iris. The eyes of the parasites that burrowed into his skin. Parasite Kurt smiled. Are you scared? My knees felt watery and terribly weak. My car was close, but would I be able to outrun him? Would I be able to run at all? Kurt's shoulders heaved and he started to chuckle. Then a voice, his voice, came both from inside the house and from the body in front of me. I'm scared too, but holy shit. Come, have a look. Kurt, pale, sick, exhausted Kurt, appeared behind his shiny doppelganger. They laughed in tandem and then waved me inside. Shiny Kurt's movements were clumsier and lagged slightly, but there was no doubt about it. They were moving together. I tried to run, but my knees gave out and I fell instead. Shiny Kurt helped me up, in the process leaving a glistening handprint of film on my arm. Come inside, he repeated. Oh, one Kurt is scary enough. With two, I had no chance of getting away. So, I followed his parasite doppelganger into the house. What is this? I asked. Kurt grinned. With a surge of nausea, I noticed that his arms remained pocked with dark, inflamed holes. The sunlight didn't kill them. It made them grow. An unsettling mixture of fear, disbelief, and irritation rattled my already shot nerves. Your parasites grew you a new... And you're happy? I can control him. Kurt threw his arms into the air. A fraction of a second later, shiny Kurt followed suit. I can speak through him. And I can see through his eyes. He ran his hands through his hair, laughing triumphantly as his doppelganger did the same. <laughs> He's me. Well, another part of me. Okay, Kurt. This isn't... Oh, what if there are more inside you? There aren't any more. His certainty gave me a chill. For the first time since this started, I wanted no part of it. They're all him now. Somehow, I talked both Kurtz into sleeping. It's been several hours now. I'm worried about Kurt. The holes in his arms look infected. Even worse, I lost a lot of time. I last spoke to Kurt on Tuesday afternoon. 
It's now Thursday evening. An entire day passed while I was in that portal. And that doesn't make sense at all. According to the way the seasons change in the painting, time passes more quickly there than it does here. As for the injury inflicted by the eyeless thing, it looks alright. The edges are too pale, with an iridescent sheen I can't think about for too long. Well, I can't think about Kurt either, really. I've tried to sleep a few times, but whenever I drift off, I hear the faint sound of that piping, combined with the atonal singing I heard in the labyrinth. Every time I wake up, I have to fight the urge to return to the house, to that portal. I'm finally afraid, finally seeing this entire situation for the horror show it is, rather than the adventure I wanted it to be. I don't know what I'm going to do though. They know my name and they have my blood. I don't think I have a way out anymore. Kurt has a closet full of sprouts and human bones. I found it by accident the other night, after he and his parasite doppelganger fell asleep. Oh, it looked like a shrine. Tangles of vines coated the walls, competing for space with glossy, striated leaves and those luminescent night blossoms. The bones were suspended from the ceiling. Vines snaked through sockets and ribs, hoisting them up as effectively as a harness. Sprouts cover everything like confetti. Unlike the flowers, they're dead. Whole but dry, fragile and crumbling from root to crown. I reached out to touch them. I don't know why. I didn't want to. It was a numb, thoughtless compulsion, almost like a spell. The greenery enveloped my arm, gentle and cool like mist. My fingertips quivered a fraction of an inch from the sprouts, and one of them twitched. Dry matter plumped and darkened, growing into a rich green shoot with lush leaves. The root snaked upward. At the bottom, I saw an eye, small, round and metallic, like that of a goldfish. I reared back and slammed the door, then, obsessively, scanned my skin for sprouts and eyes. I heard footsteps from the living room. What are you doing? Kurt's shadow preceded him, stretching over the wall. What's in there? I screamed. Evie. He halted in the mouth of the hall. Bruisey shadows and painful hollows marred his face, making him look horrifically sick. The real one. What do you mean, the real one? The body I found in the house wasn't her. It was the younger copy, the one I told you about. He motioned vaguely to the living room, to his parasite twin. More like him than anything, but not quite. He rubbed his neck fretfully. I'll tell you what I know. Come into the kitchen. I did as he said and sat at the table while he clattered around, trembling. He threw on a pair of yellow dishwashing gloves, then brewed tea and put together a plate of cold leftovers. He set both in front of me and took a seat at the opposite end of the table. Only when I started to eat and drink did he speak. Evie had a lot of problems, he began. Actually, from what Kurt had described, Evie was insane. She claimed to be the victim of an adoption gone wrong, a kid who'd slipped through the cracks and been sold to a new parent. That parent was a rich woman who supposedly ran a network of private schools for disadvantaged youth. Evie told Kurt the schools were just a front for a breeding program and a training regimen to create what she called obedient sociopaths. According to Evie, the babies were invariably used in rituals. Rituals for what? I asked. To create circuses, he answered, among other things. Evie told Kurt all about circuses basically from day one. A circus is a locus, a place where several planes of reality converge. 
Circuses do not occur naturally. They have to be built, and building a circus is a horrifically violent process. Even worse, the builders have no say over which planes converge. <laughs> More often than not, you end up with a circus that you can't control, filled with beings and artifacts that actually use you. Entities that possess the ability to manipulate or rewrite reality on a whim. We can't comprehend these beings, because we exist on the most mundane of planes. Not due to chance, but because we, as a species, expect and require the mundane. We influence and shape our own reality to suit our comfort zone. Our collective will functions as a creative force, but that collective will isn't enough to control these entities. Circuses help with that. A proper circus acts as a cage. But, like all cages, the bars rust and the locks break if you aren't careful. And that was why Evie left him. Her guardian, old now, on her deathbed, ordered her to take care of the circus. Kurt was flabbergasted. What kind of horror story fairy tale MK Ultra shit was this? Evie claimed they'd kill him if she didn't do it that his life was in danger as well as the world itself. When he tried to stop her, she assaulted him and he got her temporarily committed on a 72-hour psychiatric hold. But when he went to see her the next day, well, she wasn't there. No one even confirmed that she'd been there at all. She disappeared. Two years later, he found her by accident. She looked awful and was desperately lonely. A bad guardian, she kept saying. I'm a bad guardian. And she asked him to stay with her. He was happy to do it. He worried about her. He missed her. He loved her. The next day he zipped back to his place to gather some belongings. When he returned to Evie's house, it was gone. In place of her charming little two-story, sat a sprawling ranch house, occupied by a couple with a kindergarten-aged daughter and a newborn son. Kurt came back every day, and each time he saw a different house, occupied by different people. No one noticed but him. After a couple more years of this, the young version of Evie came to his house, just like he'd said before. He followed her back to the circus house and made it inside, where he found the real Evie. The wrong one got violent and knocked him out. When he came to, both were gone. The wrong version returned to him several times after that. Even though he was afraid, he always followed every time, because that was the only way to reliably find Evie's house. Evie herself was never there. He saw her in the painting once, at the side of the pale, long-haired entity. He couldn't get inside it, though. It was like staring through an unbreakable window. He saw them, and they saw him, but they were trapped on opposite sides of the portal. Sometimes, though, there would be dry bundles of sprouts and vegetation on his side. Over time, the taxidermy animals and specimen cases appeared, too. He assumed this meant he wasn't the only thing using the circus, but as of now he's never seen the other user. At some point, he claims he doesn't remember, but I call bullshit. He found out the sprouts are regenerative. All the plants from the painting are, in some form or another. They bring dead things back to life. Sometimes they create life from nothing. Sometimes they transfer life between creatures. On his very last visit with Wrong Evie, he once again saw the real Evie in the painting, dismembered and flayed to death, just beyond the threshold. The barrier was gone. He ran in and cradled her. She was still warm. Wrong Evie followed him in and laughed. In a rage, he killed her and left her in the house. Then he packed up the remains of real Evie and took her home coated her with sprouts and vines, and he's been waiting ever since. Then why do the hell do you think she's still in that painting? I demanded. Because she is. 
when he went into the painting with me. He followed the song. That wordless, eerie, open-throated song all the way into the woods. Even though her bones were in his closet, Evie was there, under a giant rib cage in a grove of thistles. He couldn't touch her, though she could touch him. In fact, she gave him the parasites to show him what must be done, she said. She told him the secret of the god in the pyramid, that no dead thing resurrected unless it willed resurrection. It didn't want to resurrect her. Uh, it wanted to keep her. The only way to trick it is with the help of its guard, the pale, long-haired man with scales. He alone can override the will of the god, but he needs a worthy bribe. That bribe is freedom. Why didn't you ever bring the painting here? Because if it isn't at the circus, the thing in the pyramid escapes. I stared down into my cup, trying to hide my anger from him. Tendrils of steam curled upward, warm and strangely soothing. I stirred the tea, taking savage pleasure in the obnoxious clink of silverware against ceramic. Crumbled leaves surfaced and spun in a vortex. Why me? Why am I involved at all? The bribe is an escape. The guard can only leave if someone else takes his place. I need a body. Within the whirlpool of tea grit came a flash of gold. It spun around and floated to the surface, resolving into a small metallic eye. I couldn't inhale or exhale. The guard needs a replacement, and the guard needs an offering. Then I'll get Evie back. I don't want to kill you, and that's why Evie did this, to show me it's safe. You have to let them grow for a little bit, then you pop them in the sun. When it's grown, we give one to the jailer, one to the guard. You don't even have to go through the portal. We can control them, we can make them do what we want. It's completely safe. Yours were only in your skin, I said. You made me drink them. He stared at me with a pained, guilty shock. The room was silent and deafening all at once, and the air felt heavy. Terribly, terribly heavy. I bolted. He caught me before I reached the living room and lifted me off the ground. I flailed and kicked, driving him into the wall. His grip loosened, and I squirmed away, only to slam into his parasite double. Together, they dragged me to the hall. Up close, Kurt's arms were a horror show. The inflamed flesh inside the holes bubbled up and spilled over his skin like burn scars. Parasite Kurt looked almost translucent, like a thin scrim of water was trapped between layers of flesh. In a panic, I bit down on Parasite Kurt's hands. A gush of thin, sweet liquid erupted from the puncture. I accidentally aspirated it, and my entire mouth and throat went numb. While I struggled to breathe, they forced me into the closet and locked the door. I fell onto the pile of bones, tangling in the vines and tearing blossoms apart. When I finally straightened up, the skull dangled inches from my face. Bright flowers glowed from each socket, equal parts horrifying and dreamily lovely. All around me, the dead sprouts came to life, golden eyes opening along the roots one by one. I tried to move, but couldn't. The numbness had spread, overtaking my shoulders and chest. Sleepiness came with it. The thing I saw were the eyes, a hundred, then a thousand, sparkling like miniature searchlights in the dim glow of the flowers. As I drifted off, I became dimly aware of a maddening itch in my heel. I woke to a sensation of uncomfortable pressure and painful tugging, like something was pulling muscle out through my skin, slowly turning inside out. My throat hurt, my arms hurt, and my foot radiating a deep, maddening itch. 
everything flooded back, and I opened my eyes. Long, glistening larvae towered from dozens of holes in my right arm, thick as tentacles covered in round, glittering eyes. They stretched painfully, straining toward the wall. Little pockets of my swollen tissue stretched with them, tenting along the base of each lava. I threw up. Brackish fluid choked with plant matter and a metallic ice flooded my lap. I kicked away, then shrieked as something shifted inside my heel. It felt like a snake, coiling and sliding across itself. My shoe shifted as something pushed it off tickling my arch as it fell away. The parasite snaked out of my foot, rough edges scraping the skin of my heel. A sparkling serpent reared up like a cobra. Rippling fins propelled its narrow body upward. Bright blue eyes glittered from its sides, glinting like crystal in the dimness. After regarding me curiously, it darted upward and wove itself into the ribcage. All of its eyes were fixed on my left arm. Quivering, I looked down at my arm, expecting the worst. Roots and sprouts dusted my skin, but the flesh was whole and unblemished. Even the injury inflicted by the sprout beast, the wound the guard had sucked clean, was gone. All that remained was a patch of strange white flesh that glimmered with an iridescent sheen. I looked up at the larvae. They too were focused on that patch of skin. That was why they were straining. They were trying to get away from it. On impulse, I threw my arm toward them. With a volley of pain unlike anything I've ever experienced, they plunged down into my arm. They were big, much bigger than Kurt's, and my skin bulged with the strain. Electric bursts of pain shot through my body, subsuming all my senses in a white nova of agony. I screamed helplessly, which quickly devolved into a wet, painful coughing. Another torrent of fluid came up. To my horror, tiny larvae wriggled weakly in the puddle. I sobbed and reached for the doorknob. To my shock, it turned, spilling me out into Kurt's hallway. Soft midday shadows cloaked the hall, but I saw clear, clean sunlight streaming into the living room straight ahead. I tried to stand, but my legs weren't strong enough. Sobbing weakly, I crawled to the living room and collapsed in the light. Both Kurt and his double were gone. The house was quiet, enveloped in that soft, stuffy stillness peculiar to hot days. I writhed miserably weeping and screaming as my larvae erupted. They were easily five times the size of Kurt's, thick and rope-like and several inches tall. Even worse, they made noises, keening, high-pitched screaks that seemed to slice through my head. I coughed helplessly the entire time, stomach and lungs expelling incredible amounts of dark fluid. Roots, sprouts, and weak parasites came with every expulsion. It smelled sweet, almost tropical, with hints of citrus and flowers and warm rain. The larvae were too large to simply explode. Instead, they ruptured, swelling and splitting like overcooked sausage and spattering everything with thick, translucent ichor. Had I been physically capable, I'd have crawled out of the light just to escape the pain. But between the endless coughing and weakness, I was as good as paralyzed. Eventually, I faded out. A sensation of warm heat and softness woke me up after sunset. I turned over. Something squelched under me, thick and damp like jelly. I sat up and found myself wallowing in a pool of exploded larvae. Strings of their tattered skin trailed from inflamed holes in my arm, reminding me, absurdly, of seaweed. Their eyes lay everywhere, glinting dully in the dying light. My foot twitched. Whimpering, I looked up as the serpentine thing snaked out of my heel. 
The skin around it was baggy and pale like a blister. The serpent darted over the mass of jelly, picking out the eyes and eating them eagerly. Stomach lurching, I glanced at the holes in my arms. Pus rimmed the edges, paleness contrasting with the furious, swollen red. Each pit bore downward like a honeycomb cell. At the bottom of one, I saw a quivering mass of tissue studded with small eyes. Altogether, I counted ten. Ten ruined pits in my skin, glittering with fresh larvae. They're growing back. I tried to pull the rippling snake from my foot, but before I could touch it, it burrowed in deep. Oh, I swear, I can feel it curling around the bone. Maybe that's why I'm weak. It's damaged the tendons and muscles. Breathing isn't easy. Each inhale is ragged and thick. Soreness radiates from my ribs and down to my stomach. It's more larvae. They're inside me. I know it. I have to go back to the house, because my only hope is the guard. Kurt said he needs a body as a bribe. Well, that's fine. I've got my own slippery doppelganger growing. The lava jelly is bubbling up before my eyes, slowly resolving into a copy of me. If it doesn't want a doppelganger, well... I can always give it Kurt. Even now, after all the lies, I feel for him. I really do. But if he wants his wife back, he has to pay the price himself. I've always preferred pain to itching. Not that I enjoy either, but Pain is straightforward. Even at its worst, pain is somehow clean. Pain also has the decency to kill you once it reaches a certain threshold. Itching, on the other hand, is filthy and consumptive. Itching can't kill you. It'll just drive you insane. In fact, if you could transform the essence of madness into sensation, well, that sensation would be itching. Itching was the only thing on my mind, as the larvae infestation worsened. Every breath produced a deep, explosive itch that wrapped over my ribs and organs. I saw vines in my mind's eye, thin and wet and tipped with golden eyes, winding their way through my body. By the time my parasitic doppelganger blinked awake, Night had fallen and my larvae had regrown. The new batch was small and stringy, ill-looking. They peeked out anxiously from the holes in my skin, quivering. My doppelganger was easy to control. Actually, there's nothing to it. When I moved, it moved. <laughs> I was glad for this, because I didn't have any energy left for conscious control. With a great deal of effort, I dressed it, and together we hobbled out to my car. There was a moment of confusion when it tried to climb into the driver's seat with me. I repositioned it into the passenger seat, struggling as it mirrored my movements. The larvae surfaced to watch, straining the tender flesh at the bottom of the holes. The drive to the suicide house, to the circus was a hallucinatory nightmare. Things crept around inside me, prodding and squeezing tissues. The winged snake in my heel thrashed angrily, nipping my skin as it attempted to chew through my shoe. Worst of all, I couldn't stop coughing. Every fit inevitably ended in a torrent of vomit choked with leaves and tiny golden eyes. My doppelganger gagged with me, Identical except for his eyes, flat and golden, comprised of a hundred parasite irises. After what felt like an eternity, I reached the circus and led my doppelganger inside. The living room had transformed into a grove. Vines and glowing flowers covered every surface. In the corner, 
dimly illuminated by the blossoms, sat the enormous anemone. Tentacles drifted dreamily, seemingly oblivious to the holes scoring its flesh. The five-eyed monstrosity lay before it, half buried in vines. I shuddered and hobbled upstairs. My doppelganger followed, hesitantly. Through my haze I heard voices, men's laughter, and a woman's playfully sarcastic bite, all underscored by atonal piping. One of the bedrooms was closed off. A bar of golden light flickered along the bottom of the door. The door to the other room was torn to pieces, drooping on a single hinge. My larvae peeked out and pulled toward the open room. A mindless, blissfully calm compulsion overtook me. I followed their lead and ducked inside. A blanket of dead vines, curled leaves and dry blossoms covered everything except a twisted figure on the bed. The larvae strained forward, eyes glittering in the moonlight. It was the warped girl, unnaturally stretched across a blood-soaked quilt. Strangely, slates lay atop each of her hands. They were piled with hairy spider legs and bloated tentacles, garnished with sprouts and dead flowers. Horrific details resolved as I came close. From throat to thigh, she was a bloody ruin. Glistening guts cascaded from her butchered abdomen. Buried in the morass was a multi-limbed fetus with several eyes. Translucent hands clutched the gory remnant of a twin. The spell suddenly broke. The larvae retracted, causing a nauseous explosion of itching that radiated to my shoulder. I turned, retching, and found myself face to face with the five-eyed taxidermy monster. It loped past me and lunged, plunging long, thick fingers into my parasite doppelganger's throat. Thick, ichor spurted like blood from an artery, and it collapsed. The serpent in my heel quivered, my knees gave out, and I slid helplessly to the floor. The five-eyed monstrosity approached and knelt before me. To my shock, it spoke. In all their forms, parasites overtake and ruin your mind. Its voice was low and liquid, almost childishly high. Lips rolled above its vast mouth the way grass ripple in the wind. Ruined minds make our doors. It touched my intact arm, the one the long-haired guardian had sucked clean. The unusually pale skin glimmered faintly. But he closed the one in you. It wrapped its cold, puffy fingers, circling my head. The touch was sharp and oddly refreshing. My mind suddenly felt clear. The larvae in my arm shuddered, producing a thrumming tickle that made me moan. The caretaker will clean you again. Find him. You just want me to trade places with it. Painful hysteria built in my chest. Something like pity crossed its face. The caretaker captures and releases charges at will. You were released once. You will be released again, though the vines will otherwise. Its eyes skated over my honeycombed arm. Your friend, the madman, wants you to take the caretaker's place so that you will release his wife. He will confront you. He surrender to the vines, and you may not recognize him. It looked meaningfully at the warped woman. Oh. She did not. Hysteria and horror continued to build, twining together like the vines. Go, it said, or I will make a door from you. I tore into the hall, past the room where the men laughed and pipes echoed, into the taxidermy room. The specimen cases were broken and empty. No taxidermy creatures remained and the painting showed only empty backdrops, 
forests and beaches, rocky canyons and golden fields, luxurious bedchambers and blood-stained dungeons. In the center hung the familiar moonlit landscape. I ran through, gasping as deep cold settled over me like a blanket. Oh, that familiar, wordless song. Beautiful, yet so very close to screaming, echoed over the plains. I veered towards the slope. The pyramid came into view, a cubist masterpiece of blinding silver and unfathomable darkness. Low veils of clouds clung to the top like a gathering storm. Itching rang along my bones as larvae shifted. I hurtled toward the labyrinth, dodging thorny vines and treacherous burrows half hidden in the brittle glass. My intact arm glimmered strangely on my periphery, milky and too smooth. It frightened me in a way even the larvae could not. I sped up, grimly ignoring the serpent writhing in my foot. Pale light guided me to the labyrinth's entrance. As I approached, I heard a low, resounding thrum. The ground vibrated, and a chorus of horns echoed through the night. To my shock, glittering beetles erupted near my feet and flooded across the grass. Other creatures followed. Antlered hogs and primordial cats, giant toads, tiny foxes with billowing clusters of tails, and more. So much more. All running away from the pyramid. I reached the entrance just as a pack of long, low wolves with tusks and bulbous eyes bolted past. Six winding paths flanked a marble promenade that led directly to the pyramid. Horns and wordless wailing echoed off the black walls. The larvae in my arm peeked out of their burrows. I fought the urge to rip them out. The pain, I knew, would make me black out. And I marched forward. More paths spun off the promenade, narrow and impenetrably dark. I hurried past, refusing to look lest I find something staring back at me. A tall, perfectly rectangular opening loomed ahead. Glimmering steps led to the entrance. I slowed to a halt at the base of the stairs. For one paralyzing moment, I thought about turning back. This was, I thought, the very last thing I wanted to do. At that moment, the serpent in my heel convulsed, sending bright, electric pain coursing through my leg. It was an apt, perfectly timed reminder that, actually, dying of an alien parasite infestation was the last thing I wanted to do. So, I went inside. Soft, smoky incense enveloped me, along with an almost debilitating heat. Vines and flowers crawled up the walls alongside veins of polished ore. Blossom and mineral glowed dimly illuminating a septet of enormous images on the antechamber wall. Five I recognized. A bull, a locust, a malformed wolf, a breathtakingly beautiful person that could have been a man or woman, and a golden dragon. Two I had trouble with. A hideously proportioned human with wings, no eyes and three mouths, and a creature with a shape I couldn't quite comprehend, whose flesh glimmered with mad arrays of stars. A sharp chorus of laughter echoed through the chamber, indulgent and somehow cruel, followed by a bone-rattling roar. I spun around anxiously, looking for a door, but only saw another set of seven images behind me. The laughter grew abruptly, both in volume and glee. My arm itched, my feet ached, and a terrible, pulsating pressure built in my chest. Breathing suddenly became impossible. A moment later, I felt it, long and wet, slithering up my throat. I gagged, tongue rolling back and touching the tip of a vine. Those strange, towering images swam before my eyes. Dreamily, I realized it wasn't laughter I was hearing, but screaming punctuated with a chilling, inhuman bellow. I 
collapsed, painfully aware of the serpent shifting in my flesh. Everything blurred together, soft and almost beautiful, as vines and larvae erupted from my throat. Tiny eyes and wet leaves glittered on my periphery. It scared me, so I closed them just as halting footsteps echoed through the chamber. I felt hands on mine, strong and cold. I looked up and saw the caretaker's strange, sharp face staring into mine. One of its eyes had ruptured, red, swollen, and unwholesomely bloated. Horror and hope suffocated me along with the vines as the guardian lowered its mouth to mine. Cold lips closed over my chin and cheeks. The itching abruptly disappeared, and I felt a bare, blissful instant of relief before an overwhelming nova of agony scorched me into unconsciousness. I surfaced to silence. Gasping, I shot up. I was naked, but could breathe just fine. No plant matter or worms choked my throat. I immediately looked at my arm. Pale, plump flesh, peppered with half-healed holes. I touched one experimentally. No itching, no larvae, just a dull, unremarkable ache. My heel was strangely horrifying, deflated and colorless, like an enormous drained blister. The sunken hole reminded me of rotting pumpkins, but at least it was empty. No serpent, no larvae, no vines. I climbed to my haunches. My hand fell into a soft pile of vegetation, and I almost screamed. It was the caretaker, shriveled and glimmering like moonlight, covered in tall, luminescent flowers that looked like lupines. Fighting back tears, I inspected my skin for any scratch or puncture. There were none. The flowers had been soft, after all, softer than anything I'd ever touched. But was that any guarantee? Just as I began to calm down, a low, wet rumble rumbled through the antechamber. I jumped up and saw the door where there hadn't been one before, under the feet of the bull, low and glowing with a rich golden light. A hideous, incomprehensible shadow filled that beautiful doorway and lumbered into the antechamber. Seven enormous, sinewy limbs exploded from a twisted torso. Four were vaguely human. Three were thick vines studded with glittering eyes. Sprouts and humming tangles of bright-eyed larvae laced every inch of its raw flesh. A human head crowned the monstrosity, warped and lumpy with clusters of subcutaneous vines. A feathery anemone extended from its mouth, straining the skin to such a degree that the flesh had split up to the eyes and ears. Blood sheeted past its cheekbones, choked with vines and squirming with small worms. Dangling from a broken jaw was half an eerie, translucent fetus, the twin, I realized, to the one at the suicide house. The anemone snaked forward and spun open, bearing a tangled spiral of teeth that made me think of sharks. In the center of that spiral, Set into the throat like a gem, lay a massive cluster of golden eyes. The anemone shifted sharply, straining upward to offer full sight of the human head from which it sprouted. Kurt! Kurt's head, Kurt's body, Kurt's mind, warped and erupted and overtaken by the vines. His right eye found the dead caretaker buried in his cairn of flowers, then spun toward me, radiating madness and triumph. And I knew, somehow, what he was thinking. <laughs> He'd won. Yes, I was the new guardian, and I would now release his wife. Sadness and profound rage swept through me just as the caretaker shifted under his glowing lupine. A deafening roar shook the pyramid. The anemone stood at attention, and Kurt looked back at the small door, panic flickering across his ruined face. And then he lunged at me. 
The caretaker exploded from his funeral grove in a tornado of stems and glittering petals, launching himself at Kurt. He reached into that nightmare gullet, ignoring the spiral teeth, and plucked out the golden cluster of eyes. That roar sounded again. Dust rained from the ceiling. Leaves and flower vines rattled as if in a wind. The guardian ignored it and continued his methodical dismemberment of Kurt. A chorus of shrill screaming issued from Kurt as larvae squirmed and shot out of his flesh, swaying several feet in the air before diving down at the guardian. Glistening bodies swarmed over the guardian's snowy arms. I turned and ran, hurtling down the promenade oblivious to the numbing cold. I don't know how I made it back to the suicide house, but I did. I stumbled past empty paintings and taxidermy monsters who now breathed, past the warp woman's corpse and the laughing men. Salt crunched under my feet as I tore down the stairs and out into the yard. It was dark and I was panicked, so my nakedness didn't matter to me. I slid into the front seat of my car and sped home, where I inspected every inch of my flesh. My hands are smooth and unmarked. My feet are not. Small scratches and punctures litter the skin. But I think I'm all right. They're already healing, and the skin is smooth and unusually pale. But just in case, I drenched my feet in hydrogen peroxide, washed them, and sprayed them with a cheap herbicide. God, it hurt like hell. I can barely stand and I'll have scars, but it's worth it. Then I showered in the hottest water I could stand and stumbled to bed. I woke this afternoon to a very familiar painting propped against my bedroom wall. <laughs> it's just a painting for now. Rich oils and silver tones depict the scene as I first saw it. A crisp spring night with a tall, inhuman figure framed by luminescent flowers and strange trees. I left it there and went to the suicide house. Instead of Evie's two-story house, I saw a neat little bungalow with a breathtaking rose garden. I drove by three times before going back home. I haven't done anything with the painting, but I need to, soon. I had a really good look at it just now, and there's a problem. In the distance behind the caretaker is another figure, malformed and multi-limbed, coated in vague suggestions of vines and worms. I don't know what happens to doorways when you burn them, but I'm about to find out. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?